we now move on to another task that is very hazardous by nature and that is the use of lifting equipment such as a lift truck using mechanical equipment to move and store materials increases the potential for injury to employees workers must be aware of both manual handling safety concerns and safe equipment operating techniques employees should avoid overloading equipment when moving materials mechanically by letting the weight size and shape of the material being moved dictate the type of equipment used all material handling equipment has rated capacities that determine the maximum weight the equipment can safely handle and the conditions under which it can handle that weight employers must ensure that the equipment rated capacity is displayed on each piece of equipment and is not exceeded except for load testing now, although workers may be knowledgeable about powered equipment they should take precautions when stacking and storing materials when picking up items with a powerful industrial truck workers must do the following center the load on the forks as close to the mast as possible to minimize the potential for the truck tipping or the load falling avoid overloading a lift truck because it impairs control and causes tipping over do not place extra weight on the rear of a counterbalanced forklift to allow an overload adjust the load to the lowest position when traveling follow the trucks manufacturers operational requirements and finally pile and cross tier all stack loads correctly when possible there may be times where we need to use a crane now cranes are used for all sorts of purposes mainly for lifting items from one place to another the type of crane used will depend on a number of factors such as the size of the load, the location of the loading, unloading, the type of load, the distance or height the load must be moved, and the conditions under which the load must be moved. In order to choose the correct equipment for the task, we need to know the difference between the different type of cranes. Employers must permit only thoroughly trained and competent workers to operate cranes. Operators should know what they are lifting and what it weighs. For example, the rated capacity of mobile cranes varies with the length of the boom and the radius. When a crane has a telescopic boom, it is extended and the radius increases. To reduce the severity of an injury, employers must take the following precautions. Equip all cranes that have adjustable booms with boom angle indicators. Provide cranes with telescoping booms with some means to determine boom lengths unless the load rating is independent of the boom length. Post load rating charts in the cab of cab operated cranes. Require workers to always check the crane's load chart to ensure that the crane will not be overloaded by operating conditions. Instruct workers to plan lifts before starting them to ensure they are safe. And then tell workers to take additional precautions and exercise extra care when operating under power lines. Teach all workers that outriggers on mobile cranes must rest on firm ground, on timbers, or be sufficiently cribbed to spread the weight of the crane and the load over a large enough area. Here are some further safety precautions. Direct workers to always keep hoisting chains and ropes free of kinks or twists and never wrap around a load. Train workers to attach loads to the load hook slings, fixtures and other devices that have the capacity to support the load on the hook. Instruct workers to pad sharp edges of loads to prevent cutting slings. Teach workers to maintain proper sling angles so that slings are not loaded in excess of their capacity. Ensure that all cranes are inspected frequently by persons thoroughly familiar with the crane, the methods of inspecting the crane, 
and what can make the crane unserviceable. Crane activity, the severity of use and the environmental conditions should determine inspection schedules. Ensure the critical parts of the crane, such as crane operating mechanisms, hooks, air or hydraulic system components and other load carrying components are inspected daily for any mull adjustment, deterioration, leakage, deformation or other damage. Supervisors as well as equipment operators of cranes or telescopic forklift drivers should be provided with easily comprehensible loading charts showing the weights of the typical materials used on the site, such as the weights of pallets of bricks, blocks, scaffolding boards and standards, or mortar skips. This will enable them to estimate the load they are placing on the scaffold and ensure that it is less than the safe working load indicated on the signs. Let's talk about something now that plumbers do almost on a daily basis. Welding. We understand that there are many different types of welding. Fusion welding, PVC welding, but in this section of the course we are going to talk about welding that creates the risk of a fire. Now working with ignition sources near flammable materials is referred to as hot work and welding as well as cutting are examples of hot work. One of the first steps to ensuring hot works management is performing a hot work permit or the registration for a hot work permit. This helps to reduce the risk of starting a fire by welding or cutting in areas where there are flammable or combustible materials. But we have just reached the part of the course now where we need to again read the law. So please bear with me as I read what the minimum compliance requirements are from the regulations. For this, we go to your general safety regulations section 9, where it has the heading welding, flame cutting, soldering and similar operations. No employer or user of machinery shall require or permit welding or flame cutting operations to be undertaken unless the person operating the equipment has been fully instructed in the safe operation and use of such equipment and in the hazards which may arise from its use. Unless effective protection is provided and used for the eyes and respiratory system and where necessary for the face, hands, feet, legs, body and clothing of persons performing such operations, as well as against heat, incandescent or flying particles or dangerous radiation. Leads and electrodes holders are effectively insulated and the workplace is effectively partitioned off where practicable and where not practicable all other persons exposed to the hazards contemplated in paragraph B are warned and provided with suitable protective equipment. No employer or user of machinery shall require or permit welding or flame cutting operations to be undertaken in a confined space unless effective ventilation is provided and maintained or masks or hoods maintaining a supply of safe air for breathing are provided and used by the persons performing such operations. No employer or user of machinery shall require or permit electric welding to be undertaken in wet or damp places, inside metal vessels or in contact with large masses of metal unless the insulation of the electrical leads is in a sound condition, the electric holder is completely insulated to prevent accidental contact with current carrying parts, the welder is completely insulated by means of boots, gloves or rubber mats and at least one other person who has been properly instructed to assist the welder in case of an emergency is and remains in attendance during operations, provided that the provisions of this subregulation shall not apply to a welding process where the maximum voltage to earth does not exceed 50 volts. 
no employer or user of machinery shall require or permit welding, flame cutting, grinding, soldering, or similar work to be undertaken in respect of any tube, tank, drum, vessel, or similar object or container where such object or container is completely closed, unless a rise in internal pressure cannot render it dangerous, or contains any substance which, under the action of heat, may ignite or explode, or react to form dangerous or poisonous substances, unless a person who is contemplated to pronounce on the safety thereof has, after examination, certified in writing that any such danger has been removed by opening, ventilating, or purging with water or steam, or by any other effective means. And lastly, where hot work involving welding, cutting, brazing, or soldering operations is carried out at places other than workplaces which have been specifically designated and equipped for such work, the employer shall take steps to ensure that proper and adequate fire precautions are taken. Let's recap this very important piece of regulations. Remember, this is the minimum requirement, ensuring that both the employer as well as the user of machinery, the employee actually performing the work, ensures minimum safety compliance to regulations. So again, working with ignition sources near flammable materials is referred to as hot work. Welding is an example of hot work. Getting a hot work permit before performing hot work is just one of the steps involved in a hot work management program that helps to reduce the risk of starting a fire by welding. Please ensure that you adhere to not only the minimum standards, but achieve best practice by making all work that involves welding and hot work as safe as possible. There is no doubt that excavations is a very high risk working environment for all plumbers. When it comes to excavations, we must ensure that competent persons inspect and pronounce the safety of all excavations at least once before every shift or before any commencement of work, especially after rain, to ensure that all persons working in an excavation are kept safe. Well, again, we've come to that part of the program. Let us now read what the regulations state for you to adhere to excavation safety. For this, we go back to the general safety regulations, this time section 13, with the heading Demolition and Excavation. Every employer who performs building work shall, with respect to any such work in connection with a demolition, of a structure or the making of an excavation, with regard to a structure being demolished, take steps to ensure that no floor, roof or other part of the structure is so overloaded with debris or material as to render it unsafe. All practicable precautions are taken to avoid the danger of the structure collapsing when any part of the framing of a framed or partly framed building is removed or when reinforced concrete is cut, and precautions are taken in the form of adequate shoring or such other means as may be necessary to prevent the accidental collapse of any part of the structure or of any adjoining structure. Not require or permit any person to, and no person shall, work under unsupported overhanging material or in an excavation which is more than 1.5 meters deep and which has not been adequately shored or braced if there is a danger of the overhanging material or the sides of the excavation collapsing. Take steps to ensure that any support, shoring or bracing contemplated in paragraph B is designed and constructed 
so that it is strong enough to support the overhanging material or the sides of the excavation in question. Where the stability of an adjoining building, structure or road is likely to be affected by demolition work on a building or the making of an excavation, such steps as may be necessary to ensure the stability of such building, structure or road and the safety of persons. Ascertain, as far as is practicable, the location and nature of electricity, water, gas and other similar services which may in some way be affected by the work to be performed and shall before the commencement of such work that may in this way affect any such service take such steps as may be necessary under the circumstances to render all persons involved safe. Cause convenient and safe means of access to be provided to every excavation in which persons are required to work and which is more than 1.5 meters deep, provided that in the case of an excavation which is more than 50 meters in length, a safe means of access shall pre be provided at intervals of not more than 50 meters. Cause every excavation which is more than 1.5 meters deep, including all bracing and shoring, to be inspected by a person who is competent to pronounce on the safety thereof, at least once before every shift and before the commencement of work after rain, to ensure the safety of persons, and cause every excavation which is accessible to the public or which is adjacent to the public roads or thoroughfares or whereby the safety of persons may be endangered to be adequately protected by a barrier or fence at least one meter high and as close to the excavation as is practicable and provided with red warning lights or any other clearly visible boundary indicators at night or when visibility conditions are poor. During one of our IOPSA monthly hot topics, we discussed the dangers of excavations and trenching. And during that month, we selected this topic because of the incident that occurred on the 11th of August, 2023. Three City of Twiney contractors died on that Friday after a trench they were working in collapsed. Now the City of Twiney Emergency Services spokesman Mabaso said that other employees were hospitalized with injuries and two others who were on the scene escaped the disaster unharmed. This incident happened on Myburg Street in Capitol Park where the workers were repairing a sewerage line. What were they working in? A 6 meter deep, 4 meter wide trench. After the incident, Mabaso said that retrieving the bodies by rescue technicians using back acting earthing machines would take up to 12 hours because of the unstable nature of the ground. What lesson did we learn and take home because of this incident? That cave ins kill workers. Excavation hazards are common in the plumbing industry. These plumbers are more than twice as likely to be killed as workers in any other type of construction work. Excavations and trenches are unstable by nature and many types of serious hazards exist when doing this type of work. So as a plumber, we must identify what law governs excavations and we've just read it. General Safety Regulation, Section 13. Since excavations are also considered construction work, depending on the depth and the width of the actual excavation, the Construction Regulation, Section 13, may also need to be considered. Due to its hazardous nature, the excavation or trench can also be considered a confined space, and as such, we also have to adhere to the requirements of General Safety Regulation Section 5, Work in Confined Spaces. All employees must know the dangers that while working in a trench, a cave-in can happen when the soil is unstable, 
when there is a lot of vibration from trains, trucks, traffic or machinery, when there is too much weight too close to the sides of the excavation from excavated material, tools, equipment, materials or vehicles on site, when there is water in the excavation, when there are changes in the weather like heavy rain, freezing or melting conditions. Cave-ins can suffocate or crush a worker. Hazardous atmospheres can kill or injure workers. Oxygen deficiency can suffocate a worker. Flammable gases or vapors can cause fires and explosions. Toxic gases or vapors can kill or seriously injure workers. Workers can drown in water, sewage or chemicals if these haven't been controlled by diverting them somewhere else or by locking them out to prevent worker exposure. Workers can face burns, electrocution or explosions while working around various underground utilities such as steam, hot water, gas as well as electricity. So what did we learn in the basic minimum compliance in terms of General Safety Regulation 13? Every employer who performs this type of work must make sure that precautions are taken in the form of adequate shoring or such other means as may be necessary to prevent the accidental collapse of any part of that structure or adjoining structure. You are not allowed to permit any person to work and no person themselves should work in any excavation that is unsupported, especially in an excavation which is more than 1.5 meters deep, if it has not been adequately shored or braced, or if there is a danger of any overhanging material or the sides of an excavation collapsing. And when we do support the sides by bracing or shoring, we must make sure that it is designed and constructed by a competent person and is strong enough to support the sides of the excavation. When doing inspections on excavation, we want to remember the zone of influence. This is where the stability of adjoining buildings, structures or roads are likely to be affected by the actual excavation work. And we must take steps that are necessary to ensure the stability of not only the buildings and the structures and the roads around us, but also the excavation itself for the safety of persons working in and around that excavation. Before you even contemplate doing any excavation, have you ascertained as far as practical the location of electricity, water or gas or any other similar services which may be present and which may give rise to dangers and hazards that could affect employees working in or around that excavation? Has safe means of access been provided to and from the excavation for any excavated work more than 1.5 meters deep? And for any excavation or trenching that is longer than 50 meters in length, these same safe means of access must be provided at intervals of not more than 50 meters. Before every shift and before the commencement of any work as well as after any rain or inclement weather, the safety of persons inside excavations must be ensured by inspecting the entire excavation by a person who is competent to do so. All excavations must be adequately protected by a barrier or a fence that is at least one meter high and as close to the excavation as is practicable. During times when visibility is affected, red warning lights or any other clearly visible boundary indicators must be provided.